Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And that's what my sanctification is. Now, that's the bigger picture of sanctification. In this context, though, since it talks about this is the will of God, he opens it up a little bit in the area of sexuality, or I should say um, sensuality would be a better word than sexuality. So let's go to this passage, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through verse 8. And here's what you read. It says, for this is the will of God. I hope you have your Bible open and that you're underlining every time you see that phrase. This is the will of God. This is the will of God. Do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. So what is the will of the Lord? And it says, your sanctification. So again, one more time, I say this with much love. God wants us who have trusted Christ as Savior to be sanctified. Now to do that, Our power to be sanctified, not positionally only, that happens when we trust Christ, but practical sanctification happens when I'm filled or controlled or influenced by the Spirit of God through yieldedness to Him, through by obedience to His Word. Okay, I got that, so now I'm ready to be sanctified. So now our question is, all right, in what particular area is the will of God, my sanctification, that God is speaking to me in, and what very important area should it be in? And it's going to be in our purity. All right, let's look at the passage. What does he mean by it? There are four of them here. I think I could pick this out for you. You can maybe mark it yourself. Let's go on. It says, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Abstain from sexual immorality. Now, I could go through all the different Greek words. I could take you through a a litany of passages that will amplify what poinonia means and all that pornography. But I believe that your adults... And I believe in your own mind, you know what sexual impurity would be or sexual immorality would be. So let me make this clear on the positive note. Sex is not wrong. Sex is exciting. Sex is something that God has designed us for, to give and to receive and to enjoy for His glory. It is, be, it is to be done, though, in His context for us to have the fullness of it. Anything outside of that is not only not going to bring us fullness, but it will bring us consequences that we will um, have to experience for for all eternity, even as a believer, when we step out of that. So when I speak about this, I'm not anti-sex. I'm very pro-sex, but within the proper confines of it all, all right? So let's keep that in mind when we do that. So here it's talking about sexual immorality. So if it's a thought, you need to watch out for it. If it's on the screen, you need to watch out for it. If you're dealing with it in a relationship right now, I would say flee from it as fast as you can. It's, um, th- this may be hard for you to receive, so I, I hope I can say it as tenderly as I can. Um, <clears throat> when I have Christians come to me uh, as pastor here and um, they want to get married, and I'm excited for them to want to get married and t- together as believers in Christ, I usually begin to ask them, I, uh, how, how do you know? How do you know this is the person God wants? And they'll go through all this. And how do you know that he is all this? And I let them do all of that. And I'm, I'm kind of listening for what they're saying, but I'm more listening for what they're not saying. I let them go through all of that, using that to gain information so I could give them good counsel. And I would hope that all of you that are deciding to get married, you just don't get to someone who gives you two little counseling sessions and out the door you go, and say, oh, you don't need any help. You've been all around the barn long enough. I pray that you get someone to go through it. Then I'll ask them this question. Um, I don't need any details, but this is going to help me as pastorally counseling you, and that is this. Are you having any, any sexual intimacy with one another at this point? And you'll be surprised how that when you get the 20-somethings, and I'm not blanketing all of them, but you'll know what I mean, how many of them just have lived so long into that sex is very important, very sacred, very special, but it's also something that we want to, you know, drink the milk before we buy the cow kind of a thing. And so they're out there doing this. And when you bring them that, it's like, huh? Oh, yeah, we're, we're with each other. We're enjoying each other. We're going to get married. We're, we're, we saved ourselves for each other. But they're all involved in this right now. And when it's outside the confines of the covenantal relationship, of the commitment to one another and to be done right, what happens then is that they're out of the will of the Lord. 
Because it says abstain. What is the will of the Lord? That you abstain from this. And if they haven't abstained it, they're out of the will of the Lord. Which then causes me to question, if you violated this, is it possible that maybe your choices even on your life mate could be under question? And so that means, are the choices of getting married at all the right choice? And getting prepared for, have you made all the right choices to prepare for marriage to anybody for that matter? Because it's a domino effect. And so would we, as Christians, we don't get the, the luxury, and I don't put that in quotes, to just trust Christ and go on with what we want and we'll sort it all out when we get to heaven. God says, no, you're, you're making a big mistake. He says, I've got a wonderful plan for your life. And it's more than just trust Christ. That's an eternal plan. But there's a, a plan now that will be rewarded later even. So it's much more. And so that's such an important part. Let me go a little bit further. Let's say that you are married and you're listening to me right now and you are involved in moral impurity, whether it's pornography or celebrating it or however far you want to go. You're out of the will of the Lord there, so there's already a chink in the armor of your breastplate where Satan is now going to come in and has come in already. And he is now scrambling up your life. And so these are not options to know the will of the Lord. They are not, I want that one, but I won't take that one. I'll do this one, but eh, a little bit later on. They are all part of a recipe for us to know the will of the Lord, for us to have the fullness of God, and ultimately for Him to get the greatest glory. So it says very clearly that we need to abstain, stop, flee from. One great counselor said this, that the seeds of a bad marriage are often planted in the moral impurity of a date life. I'll let that go. Let's go on. The second is to control your body. Kind of together in this. It says here that each one know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification again, that you're holy and set apart for a purpose of doing something and glorifying the Lord and honor. That each of you know how to possess your own vessel. Now, there are old-time writers, old-time commentators. They look at the Greek word and they will see that that word could be translated wife. And it could be translated body. And they will say it must mean wife because you'll hear the word vessel used around other contexts of marriage and all of this kind of stuff. As far as I'm sensing this passage, it does not refer to a wife that if you want to know the will of the Lord, you've got to control your wife, possess your wife. I believe it would lean more contextually to the dynamic of a body. And so now it's talking about what are we going to do with the body that we have and we need to control that body. Which means my mind can choose where my eyes go, where someone like Job could say, I made a covenant with my eyes that while I not look upon a virgin to lust after her, he made a choice what he would do with his eyeballs. Okay? Chose where I'm taking my body to submit myself to an array of stimulation that then affects my lust and passion, which we'll get into in a moment, that'll affect my glands that will now have another working against me so that I'm now crumbling and not in the perfect will of God. So it's what do we do with our bodies? What do we do to stimulate our bodies? What do we do to create the excitement for sex outside of marriage? And so he says, stop. The will of the Lord is to control your bodies. And you do that by controlling your mind, which means then let the word of God richly dwell in you. It's a mind thing, the mind of Christ. Let's go to number three. It says to subdue your passions. Now, in your notes, I just kind of gave you little portions of the verse there, but the address, but, but look again at the bigger picture. When it says here that knows how to control or use your body, it then says not in lustful passion, implying that passion itself is not wrong. You could have a passion for Christ, a passion for the ministry, a passion to reach people for Christ, make uh, the world a, a place where people would want to know Christ, that's all right. But the lustful part, the part that deals with that sensuality, it says, like the Gentiles, meaning unsaved people generally, all right, who lived a very debauched life, who do not know God. So he says, don't be like the unbelievers. Don't be like the lifestyle of a secular worldview. Don't be like all the different people that produce all the television programs, nearly all the television programs, nearly all the movies, nearly all the DVD, all that's out there, whatever mindset that's out there, not in lustful passion. And then he says, like those people. So we need to be decidedly different in our biblical worldview compared to the secular worldview as it relates to sexuality. And when they can't do that, then what do they have to do? 
This is another sermon. They have to change the rules. Oh, wait. They have to change the laws. Oh, wait. They already did that. And so now they think by changing the laws that what's happened is that we can go do these things because it's now legal for us to do it and legal makes it right. The problem is sin is not... It's not a, it's not, it's not a mind thing. The, spirit, the, the sin is a spirit thing. It's a conscience thing. And that begins to scramble us all up. So it talks about here, control your body, but also subdue your passions. And I would like to say to direct your passions to the right object for the right reason. And then finally, number four, and I think this kind of says it all, treat others fairly. The passage then goes on to say, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother, kind of in the context of believers, but that doesn't mean, okay, if I don't mess around with a believer, I can mess around with an unbeliever. Um, that's okay. I can get a harlot. I can run out after these unsaved botch guys that I work with. It's okay. They're unsaved. It doesn't really matter. I'm not really defrauding a brother or sister in Christ, so I can go ahead and do that. My answer to you is, while tec- technically it's referring to brother right here, We have to then not have a first level thinking. We have to have a second level thinking implying this, that yeah, I don't mess around. I don't defraud a fellow believer. But I also must recognize that every unbeliever will someday or could be someday a believer in Christ. If I'm messing around with that single woman, I must realize she will be somebody's wife. If I'm messing around with this single guy over here, he will be someone's husband and father and I'm not to defraud them to do that. So when we're doing this, we're wrecking them. When we dress lewdly and we draw attention to ourselves and we then enter into a sexual relationship, we have then trapped them. We've stolen their heart, stolen their affection from where it should be, planted on Christ and doing that which is righteous. So again, what is the will of the Lord? It is our sanctification. Now some of you might say, oh my goodness, I don't like these rules. Well, look what else it says. If I don't follow them, it says, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. When I step out of line in this context, and I am now not abstaining from moral impurity, I'm letting my body and my glands and my hormones go crazy on this thing. I'm not dealing with the passions. I'm not taking care of a brother. I'm messing around with a girl who is really a daughter of God, and I'm messing this all around. What is the Lord? The Lord is the avenger. You will get caught. It will mess up your thinking. It will scramble up your finances. It will destroy relationships. You will lose rewards in heaven. And who knows about the diseases you could get. Then it says, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. He says, this is not new stuff for you. And I would say to you, my dear friends, that this isn't new to all of us. We've studied stuff like this. We've heard this stuff before, haven't we? We've been warned. And yet Christians still go pell-mell after it. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but again in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man. Meaning if you reject what I'm saying, you're not really rejecting your pastor. You're not really rejecting who I am. You might growl a little bit because I didn't tell enough jokes and stories and illustrations and I preached too long or whatever, but you're really not rejecting me on this truth. But God who gives his Holy Spirit to you, so we come full circle back up to spirit-filling, and being saved. You got the power. You got the power. You can do this in Christ. You can abstain. You can control. You can take care of your passion. You can not defraud a brother or sister in Christ. You can because you have the spirit inside of you. That's if you're saved. Well, you'll want to be back next week because I want to end next week's message before Carol and I leave for a few weeks on the mainland. I want to end with, well, does God ever let me make my own choices? Can I choose pepperoni over sausage on my pizza? What is God? I mean, is every little decision I've got to fast and pray before I decide if I should put my foot, my left foot first or my right foot first? What do I have to do about all of that? Sounds pretty ridiculous. Be back next week and I'll give you the answer. That's not to be a manipulation. It's I don't have time today. But remember the foundational truth is you do Romans 12, 1 and 2 first so you can discover God's will. All right, I'm ready to discover it. What is his will? Be saved, be spirit-filled, be sanctified. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's take a moment with silence before the Lord right now. I am so grateful that I have a God who is not a God who is not just there, 
or a God who's just up there. I'm so glad that I have a God who is here. I'm so glad that I have a God who is in here in my life. I'm so glad that I have a God that I don't have to kind of fight my way through the fog of emotions and sentimentality and try to figure them out in some mountaintop experience. But I have a God who wanted to communicate to me in my language, in Scripture, and that a God who preserved the Word of God in its accuracy, a God who, even at the expense of others, who died to preserve us and bring us the Word, He cared enough. And now He's given this to us so we would know His will. He loves us. And how can we walk away? How can we close this up and go on with our next thing in life? This is just one little compartment. I finished my Sunday morning compartment. And I'm not condemning anybody, but I want to make sure that we see that our Christian life is life. It's not an event. It's not, I don't know, a calendar opportunity. It's who we are. Our life is hid in Him, Christ. Well, are you ready to submit to Him? And that would be you need to be a brother or sister in Christ, a son or a daughter of the Lord. And, and what do you do? Is it by just saying, Lord, 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 and go through all these religious things? No. Is it by preaching and speaking and saying things, communicating, prophecy? No. Is it by doing, ooh, doing the dance with the devil and kicking him out and talking about how bad he is and going against and delivering all these things? No. No. Uh-uh. Well, is it going to by doing some kind of a miracle? There's a lot of miracle churches out there. Is it by doing all of that? He said, no, that's lawless. He said, if you want to know what the will of the Lord is, you've got to do the will of the Lord, and it is what? To behold the Lord, and you behold Him by looking at Him in His Word. Over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus is the Messiah. Prophesied one who would die, rise again as the sacrifice for our sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Old Testament truth coming to life again in the New Testament. And then to believe in Him, in the One whom the Father has sent. Not behave, not believe and behave, not just believe, but believe in Him, Jesus Christ. Please do that. And if you do that, not only will you have eternal life, but now for the first time in your life, will you have the ability, the capacity to understand the will of the Lord and the power to do the will of the Lord and your life will change. I can only imagine now the kind of decisions that you'll be making. I can only imagine the kind of results that you'll have from the right decisions that you'll have. And I don't care how many wrong decisions and how deep you are in the pit. It's out of that pit that the Lord will deliver you. And He's giving you the way to do that. He's giving you the map. He's giving you the power. But you've got to go His way. So why don't you say this to the Lord? Lord, I am a sinner. I know I've missed the mark of your perfection. I know I'll never be perfect enough to go to heaven. And Lord, you know I care and you know I want to be good. And I I know these things are important. But Lord, I'm so helplessly and hopelessly lost. I, I need you to rescue me. So Lord, as hard as it is for me to do this, I, I'm just going to stop working and I'm going to just lean back into your ever-loving, saving arms. I'm depending upon you to save me from hell. Save me from myself. Save me from sin. And deliver me into a kingdom of light and life and heaven. All that you have for me. Now, however you put that together as a confirmation between you and the Lord, do it right now. On the authority of his word, I can now tell you, he says you are saved Jesus says, he that believes on me right now has everlasting life. You don't get it when you die. You got it now. And don't worry about losing it because you can't because he keeps it for you. It's reserved for you. And now you can discover what he has for you. Now remember, you were in his mind before you were born. He had a plan for you. He designed you. He put you in history. He put you under the sound of this teaching today. He's got a plan for you. He's got a will for your life. It's a good will. It's a perfect will. It's an acceptable will. You've got to be saved. You've got to consecrate. Dedicate yourself to Him. Not to be saved, but because you are. You've got to separate from the world and its systems. 
You've got to transform by your changing of your mind. Put your mind on Christ, His Word. Choosing to make your decisions based on what He tells us in Scripture. And He will. And now for the rest of you for a moment here, I'd like you to claim Psalm 143, verse 10. Here it is. Just listen very carefully. David, who wrote this, the great psalmist, the greatest king Israel had ever known, he said this. He said, teach me, O Lord, to do thy will. So for you, you might say, Lord, I cry unto you, teach me your will. Teach me to do your will. And oh, my friend, what a wonderful, exciting, and perhaps different life than you have now. Would you do that? If today was the day you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you behold Him in His Word, you beheld Him in, in the Word of God, and you trusted Christ as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. You've never done it before. You're doing it right now. I will not have you stand up. You will not come forward. You can certainly put your name in a card and let me know. That's up to you. But I would like to pray for you right now as we bring our service to a close. And the best way I can do that without anyone knowing is for you to slip up your hand, put it down, I will just simply say thank you or I saw that hand so you know that I I caught you there. And then when I pray, I'm going to generically pray for you. But the Lord knows whether you trusted Christ or not. But I'd like to know if today was the day that you did God's will, number one. You were saved because you trusted in Christ. You did the will of the Father. You trusted Christ as your Savior. Is there anyone in here right now that has trusted Christ today, in here today, You called upon Him to be your Savior. You trusted in Him. You'd like for me to pray for you. As quickly as you can, slip up your hand and put it down. Today was the day. Put it up, put it down. Anyone at all? Okay. Dear ones, get a copy of this message and give it to your friends if they're they're wanting to discover God in their life. Secondly, for those of you who are Christians being Spirit-filled, being influenced by the Spirit and not by other influences and uses the issue of alcohol, wine particularly, something else influencing you that will bring self-destruction other than the Spirit of God and the Word of God in your life. I'm not going to have you raise your hand. This is a very personal thing between you and the Lord. It's a very humbling thing. This is something that the Lord should see and hear from you, not me. I'll pray for all of us. Me too. You pray for me. That's the will of the Lord that you be Spirit-filled. Check it out. Has it shown up in your communication, your songs, your singing? How about your saying thanks, submitting to one another? And then finally, how about your sanctification, particularly your purity? How are you doing in that area? Are you abstaining from all moral impurity? Are you controlling your body? Are you subduing your passion? Are you treating others fairly? And I'd rather just simply say, would you treat others like you'd want to be treated? You would treat them like the Lord would want them to be treated. The Lord is the avenger. You can't, you can't ever get away with it. You can't touch fire without being burned. It's a law. This is a law too. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are gathered together in solidarity under your word, every one of us. And we want to thank you that you've communicated your word to us. We thank you that, Father, your spirit is working in us. We thank you that we've been convicted by your spirit. We've trusted you. We are now, in a sense, indwelt by your spirit, so you're resident in us. But now, Father, we want to have your spirit dominant in us. So, Lord, we are yielding to to the spirit of God, yielding to your word, allowing Jesus Christ to live his life out through us, to influence us to be our guide, to be our reminder, to be our convictor and the Spirit of God to empower us to do your will. And Lord, we know how susceptible we are in our generation to moral impurity, but it seems like 2,000 years ago, bang, right off the bat, there's Paul telling them that he's warned them again about moral impurity. So they had it just as rampant then as we have it now, probably more now only because we can send it through so many technological ways that they couldn't do it back then. But Lord, we pray that we would preserve ourselves holy in the sight of you so we would continue to develop, discover, and then demonstrate your will. All for thy glory. In Jesus' name. 
You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.